Yeah, no, that data is is either um, not available or withheld. That's what uh, that's another problem with mil these military releases. The imagery that's often released is, you know, according to the either pilot descriptions, especially in the case of the 2004 Nimitz encounter, or, you know, or whoever was describing this event, the imagery that gets released is the most boring part of the encounter. They never release the exciting stuff. We don't get to see the object taking off at, you know, at like a bullet out of a gun or or diving into the water and then coming out it extremely fast. We don't ever get to see these things. And, and whether that's been recorded or not, you don't actually know that doesn't get released either. And this is another reason why you can't help as a scientist, you can't help but be suspicious of the, the military and their intentions because, or not the military, but the government and their intentions, because we're only being allowed to see the most boring videos of these things. And that really doesn't help from my perspective as a scientist, that doesn't help my job because it doesn't convince my fellow Hello, scientists that anything unusual is going on you don't have any evidence that there's anything unusual going on and then that's a bit of a problem we know now that in the early years of the 20th century this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man's did the cia write wind of change by the scorpions <laughs> <laughs> As humans busied themselves about the various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied. Dr. Loeb, what percentage chance do you give it that you have indeed uncovered extraterrestrial or non-human technology? With infinite complacence, people went about their affairs, yet across an immense ethereal gulf, intellects vast and unsympathetic drew their plans against us. Prior to your abduction, did you believe in UFOs or any sort of alien life form? All things unexplained. So some of that I think there will say for close session. Hello, all you unexplained ones out there. Thank you for joining us. We are so lucky to have with us on this show, Dr. Kevin Knuth. He is a leading physicist. He is known for his pioneering work in Bayesian analysis, artificial intelligence, and astrophysics. Currently, he is working with many other researchers on the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and he's also dedicated much time looking into the areas of exoplanet detection. And what a timely moment to have you on our show as we have some breaking UAP UFO news to share with the audience. We'd love to do a deep dive in that. We're also going to take a look into some of your past and current research. So Dr. Canoe, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. Yeah, so just today, Dr. Mounts showed me a video that was released. Was it last night on TMZ? Is that what you said, Tim? Yes, last night, brand new TMZ UFO documentary. I believe this premiered on Tubi, T-U-B-I. Okay. And tell us a little bit about what, what is in this video and where it came from. So I'm going to set this up, and this is courtesy of Jeremy Corbell, and I believe the documentary is called UFO Revolution. Apparently, this is over Iraq in October 2018, a joint military operations base. I'm going to just pull it up now and let everybody see this. This is known as the jellyfish UFO. And once you see it, we'll know why. And this is breaking as of last night, courtesy of Jeremy Corbell. And if you're listening on our audio version, we are seeing what looks like a big gelatinous, maybe blob jellyfish type looking thing moving across the sky. It almost looks like, like a bad older movie with, with terrible graphics is kind of what I get from this video. But you can tell that it's going over what seems to be some type of military facility or war zone floating through the air, hovering with seemingly no form of propulsion. Right. And interestingly, they say that this jellyfish UFO was observed for about 17 minutes and then it went into the water. Unfortunately, there's no 
video of this incident. It stayed under the water at some point until it reemerged and shot off at an extreme rate of speed beyond the optical scope of the observation platform. It says it's officially classified as UAP. Its intent and capability are unknown. Some additional details here. As I said, it displayed transmedium capability, so it went from air to water and back out. It exhibited controlled descent and ascent out of the water. It displayed low observability. And Kevin, this is what I found super interesting. And it reminded me of, of you. We've seen you in a tear. Oh, yeah. In the sky. All right. Lots of thoughts. So I'll UAP the was not visible with night question, vision which was the, on the tear and appeared and to jam when... the targeting capability of the optical platform now when you were on a terran sky y'all filmed something in the sky that you could see on one camera but you could not see on another the catalina island team michael hall and david altman had spotted an object and alerted us in laguna beach Jeremy McGowan and Jason Turner took off in Jeremy McGowan's Osiris, which is his mobile unit, and they headed up the coast to try to try to find this object. Later, it, it was revealed that the object that was seen by the team in Catalina was the International Space Station. Jeremy McGowan and, and Jason Turner in the Osiris had found another object, which was probably a different object because of the, this effect, where it was visible in one of the two cameras so we had a fisheye camera that could you know have a wide field of view and then there was a pan zoom tilt camera that could focus and aim at an object and, and look at it and this was all in the ufo dap system that was mounted on jeremy's osiris the object the light was was visible in one camera but not the other and this was you know, this was recorded by the, the documentary crew also recorded this while, it, you know, while it was happening. So, so it was rather confusing. And, you know, I think we later determined was that one of the cameras had more capabilities in the infrared region of the, of the spectrum than the other camera. And so the, this object was probably visible in the infrared light, but not in visible light. And I, and from what I gather of looking at the imagery here, the fact that it's changing from being a light, a light object to a dark object, depending on background and such, that look, it looks like that's an infrared image is what, what's being, what was recorded in the, in the case in Iraq with the jellyfish object. So let me ask you first, before we dive into just the physics of what we're seeing here, what would you say about the legitimacy of this actual video upon seeing it? Did you think, yes, this is real and something that could exist that's really hard to say and this is one of the problems of data coming out of the military because we don't know what the providence of the of the imagery is we don't know all of the details usually of the events surrounding the encounter we don't know everything about the equipment that was used to record the imagery and so it's very hard to assess uh, what's what's going on here and in fact, you know, there has to be some concern of the potential for disinformation because we're dealing with, you know, the U.S. government, which has kept these things quiet for 80 years and is now, you know, it's now discussions going on with the inspector general about this. So we know that this has been kept quiet for 80 years. And so, and they haven't been forthcoming and it's not clear whether you can trust the things that are being released by them. Um, this is one reason why having scientists out there recording data with multiple instruments, multiple types of instruments is, is the best way to, to approach such a problem. So assuming that it is legitimate, we'll take all of the other stuff aside, right? Could be government disinformation, could be anybody's government disinformation. Um, assuming that it is truly something that existed that we have caught on camera, what was your initial thought upon seeing it? My, my initial thought when I, when I first saw this, I thought, well, it really looks like something on the camera lens, or if there's a dome covering the lens, it could be something on the dome. However, if you watch watch it carefully, you know, throughout the course of the video, you'll see that there's a point where the camera zooms out, right, and the object becomes smaller. If it, if it was, you know, schmutz or some dirt on the camera lens or dome, 
then that would have become wouldn't have become smaller. It would have become blurrier, right? It would have blurred because you would have gone out of focus, and or changed the focus on that part of the camera. So, so I I don't think that this is something that's on the camera dome or on the camera lens. And I'm sure there's going to be skeptics that suggest that, and that's clearly wrong because of the zooming effect. Also, the position of the object changes with respect to the the reticle. And and so it's clearly moving around and being tracked. And so you know, the best we can do at this point is to, I, I, the best thing I can do is say that it looks like it's an actual object moving across the, you know, the visual field. Great. It's sure interesting. It is. I mean, it looks a lot like, it reminds me of the Imperial probe droid from Empire Strikes Back on Hoth. <laughs> I, I was watching it, and I, in my mind, I've got running the sound, beep, 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 you know, the sound that, it, that probe droid makes <laughs> that's running through my mind when I was first watching this, because that's what it looks kind of like. I hate to make a connection between something that's purportedly factual and fictional, but it just really stood out for me. But our brains reach for something that makes sense that we have seen before. Something absolutely. you're familiar so, with, at least. Yeah. So. So for those of you just joining us, we are joined by Dr. Kevin Knuth, who is a physicist, and we are diving into the most recent UAP video that was released. And back to this UAP, as a physicist, can you talk to us at all about the actual physics of what we might be seeing with this object? Yeah, because uh, let me interject this real quick. Another thing they report is that this UAP displayed positive lift. And of course, that it was transmedium. So, what what do you make particularly of those two things? Yeah, it's not obvious how the object is aloft. Um, that's the the first surprise, and that's one that's one of the five observables that the ATIP program identified for UAPs is that you have positive lift without obvious mechanism. And then the second of the five observables, a, a second one of the five was the transmedium capabilities, the capability of going from air to water, water to air. That wasn't recorded on video, but that's reported as being associated with this object. Yeah, so it's 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 extremely interesting, but this is one of those cases where it would have been wonderful to have multiple cameras, multiple types of cameras be picking up, you know, looking for electric and magnetic fields measuring, looking at spectra, trying to detect other features that would provide us with more information about what's actually going on here, what the physics or engineering of this object is. Yes. C could you tell us what do they mean by positive lift? Oh, positive lift means that the thing is basically lifted up in the air or basically held aloft, you know, so like, like an airplane or a helicopter or a balloon, something like that. Those all experience positive lift. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the droid. You know, when I first showed this to CJ, she pondered about the old story about Russian military forces, you know, constructing like Iron Man type of warriors. And when I showed it to our military consultant, he said, you know, it reminds him of an Iron Man suit, you know. But then I wondered, wow, well, who would actually get in such a suit and fly it over an active military zone <laughs> but you know i i find it really frustrating I, I i'm sure you do too that we have so much data that are missing like supposedly it went in the water well where is that you know like what was the altitude i mean what how big is this and the same thing about the orbs do you know do we have any way of figuring out how big such an object is or you know, just some fill in the gaps of some things that are missing. Yeah, no, that data is, is either um, not available or withheld. That's what uh, that's another problem with mil these military releases or, you know, or whoever was describing this event. The imagery that gets released is the most boring part of the encounter. They never release the exciting stuff. We don't get to see the object taking off at, you know, at, like a bullet out of a gun or we're diving into the water and then coming out at extremely fast. We don't ever get to see these things. And, and whether that's been recorded or not, you don't actually know that doesn't get released either. And this is another reason why you can't help, as a scientist, you can't help but be suspicious of the, the military and their intentions because, or not the military, but the government and their intentions, because 
we're only being allowed to see the most boring videos of these things. And that really doesn't help from my perspective as a scientist, that doesn't help my job because it doesn't convince my fellow scientists that anything unusual is going on. You don't have any evidence that there's anything unusual going on. And then that's a bit of a problem. Kevin, did you have any final thoughts on, and I'll put it back up here real quick for those that might have missed it. Did you have any final thoughts on the jellyfish you will fill? Yeah, I mean, this part of the video looks, it looks rather strange. I mean, well, it's difficult to interpret an infrared video. And so this is an infrared apparently, because you can't see structures on the object and it gets, and it's blurred. These are all the complaints, you know, and this is when, when the three videos were released earlier, you know, from the Nimitz 2004 event, the gimbal and the uh, go fast videos, you know, skeptics and scientists all complained. Oh, they're all blurry. Well, of course they're blurry. It's an infrared video. It's going to be blurry. Right. <laughs> you don't have, you don't have this kind of detail in an infrared video. It's a, and it was surprising to hear scientists say this because it made me want to <laughs> slap them upside the head and say, have you ever seen an infrared image? I mean, do you have any experience with this? Because they're blurry. They're going to be blurry. It's yeah. It's heat. You're heating up the air around the object. That's that ob that air is also going to radiate. It's going to blur the image. Yeah, you get blurry images. That happens. Mm. And that happens with other imagery of UFOs too. Photographs that people take in the visible range. There's often blurry, and that's a, that's a common complaint that you hear among scientists. But when you dive into the topic and you really study these images closely, you start to realize, well, there's reasons why this is blurry. There's a lot going on here. There's actually a lot of physics going on here, which is interesting, which is leading to this being blurry. Um, a lot of these objects appear to have some kind of, appear to be ionizing the air and creating some kind of plasma sheath around the object. So that helps, that blurs the object. Some of them are clearly distorting the background. Um, in the Aguadilla case, uh, where you had the several foot long sized football shaped objects fly over the um, the airfield in Aguadilla, yes. Puerto Rico. When it passes over the parking lot, you can see in the background, you can see the lines for the parking spaces get distorted as they get close to the object, not on the object, but close to it. So this object is distorting the background imagery. And why is that happening? We don't know. That's something I would like to try to study at some point, but it would be nice to have multiple videos of this to, to study. And you could imagine if the objects, you know, in that case, the objects hot. So if the objects hot, you could be heating the air, changing the index of refraction and bending the light that way. Um, another hypothesis has been that these things might be distorting space time. Oh, you could be creating warp bubbles and things that's been one. And if that's going on, if there's any kind of gravitational distortion, you're also going to bend the light. So these objects do cause optical distortions. That's common. And it's not that people just take blurry images of UFOs. No, there's there's actual physics here and we can learn things from the physics. I mean, and and that's and that's and I find that rather disappointing when I hear scientists say that, because it's like as a scientist, you should know better. This each one of these effects is a clue as to what's going on, and you should be using these clues to piece together the physics and engineering rather than just, you know, making blanket statements. Oh, they're all blurry. And that's, that's ridiculous. So you had mentioned, you know, one of the frustrating things for you is that other scientists just sort of write these things off as not real. At what point, or was there a specific event that happened in your life that made you think, okay, something is happening here and I need to study it. That's a good question. And, 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 and for me, it wasn't an encounter or anything like this or any particular case. It was the fact that I had, when I, I grew up in Wisconsin and when I went to graduate school in, I moved, I went to Montana state university in Bozeman, Montana. So I moved from Wisconsin to Montana and this would have been in the early fall of 1988, quite a while ago, 30, almost 30 years ago. Right or more than 30 years ago at this point. It was perhaps the second week of classes. Right around then, early September, there was a cattle mutilation in Bozeman and where two cows were killed and they were surgically, whatever, I mean, affected <laughs> or operated on or manipulated. Or I don't know. I don't know what the good word for this is. 
and it, and now that I know more about cattle mutilation, it's it's a classic cattle mutilation case. So this happened with two cows on on one rancher's you know property, and there were multiple calls to the sheriff's office about UFOs that night, and so this was all over the news the next day, and the news people were all freaked out about it, and we at the physics department, the new the new physics students who had just moved here, you're basically moving to a new place and you're looking down the barrel of working on a PhD. So you're going to be spending four or five years here. And, you know, I've been here for two weeks and all of a sudden there's this cattle meat. Who goes around killing cows? I mean, why would you, do, why would anybody, this was actually my argument. Why would anybody <laughs> do this? Why would Satanists do it? Why would aliens do it? I mean, this were the discussion we were having in the hallway and it was a very, lively discussion and clearly we bothered one of the professors down the hall and um and because i was new i'm not sure exactly which professor it was i know from memory whose offices were down the hall and i have a guess it's you know one of two professors but i'm not going to name the person but that professor came out of their office wondering what the commotion was and came down the hall to talk to us and we told them, you know, about this cattle mutilation and that it was worrisome and strange. And and his his response wasn't very helpful. He said, "Well, you know, this happens from time to time here." And, what? <laughs> to which we're all thinking, "What? <laughs> Are you kidding me?" I mean, growing up in Wisconsin, I've heard of cow tipping. I've never actually <laughs> experienced it or done anything like that or known anybody who does. But I have heard about it. But not cattle mutilations. I mean, this is that's horrible. And so, you know, he goes, but this happens from time to time and it gets investigated and no one ever figures anything out. And then they kind of forget about it until it happens again, at which I don't think any of us felt any kind of security from that. But then he finished with something that was rather shocking. He said, but you know, what's really weird. He said that he had friends up working up at Malmstrom Air Force Base. Oh, yes up in northern Montana, and they have problems up there with UFOs flying over our ICBM missile sites and shooting, and not shooting down, shutting sorry, them, yeah. mistake, yeah. shutting down the missiles. Yeah. Breaking news? No. Oh, I apologize. No, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> that is a real misspeaking. <laughs> no, we, we wouldn't do that to you. Yeah, so they have problems with UFOs flying over the ICBM missile sites and shutting down the missiles. And to be honest, when he walked away, we laughed our asses off because that was the craziest thing I yeah. think I'd ever heard at this point. But the problem is that it's coming from one of our physics professors, right? right? And this isn't, I mean, it's not a silly person. And so it kind of became a running joke that year among this little cohort of graduate students where somebody would say, you know, some weird thing happened to me and they would tell a funny story and then somebody else would chime in. But you know what's really weird? UFOs are shutting down <laughs> nuclear missiles, and we went all that, right? So I, I don't think any of us believed that that was real because I, you know, and we did talk about it, and the, the general feeling was that if that's happening, that's a national security mm -hmm. issue that would be eliciting a huge right. response, which doesn't make any sense. So, so that I mean, I never gave that any thought past the joke level, right? And it wasn't until it was probably around 2015 or so I was teaching in a, an astronomy class and we were, and I had a lecture coming up on astrobiology and some of the students wanted me to talk about the possibility of aliens coming to earth. And I didn't really know what to say. I mean, there's nothing in textbooks about this, certainly. And I didn't know what intelligent things I could say about this. So I, <laughs> so I was literally just poking around on the internet, not looking for information, but just, you know, cause you're not going to find anything that you should teach in a class on the internet. But, but I was looking for just, is there anything I can even talk about that makes any kind of sense other than the Fermi paradox, right? And while I'm, while I'm poking around, I stumbled on a press conference held by Robert Hastings from, I think 2010, where he had five or six veterans or, or former um, contractors who had worked in, you know, worked on Air Force bases or in military bases where they had encounters with UFOs interacting with nuclear weapons sites, you know, nuclear weapons or storage depots. 
and three of them were, at least three of them were from Malmstrom Air Force Base. Robert Salas was the first speaker on that press conference, and he was from Malmstrom Air Force Base in 1966. Mm -hmm. And I and I was like, wait a, wait a minute. That, I heard about this in grad school. This isn't real, is it? I <laughs> said, so I watched, I watched the whole, what is it? I think the whole thing's like two hours. I, you know, I was up late night that night, <laughs> and I watched this whole press conference, and I was blown away. Yeah. I just thought, Oh my God, this is actually real. I thought there's no way you're going to get these types of people coming out on a press conference and talking about these types of events. Whereas I heard about this 30 years ago mm -hmm. in a totally different context. Right. And, um, and I thought there's no way this is made up. You can't. And those events they were talking about were from the late sixties. And it scared me, actually. I thought, we're in some kind of trouble because this is a real phenomenon and we all are just thinking it's nonsense, just like I did in grad school. Yes, we had Robert Salas on our show. Oh, have you? Wow. Yeah, and we had him for about two hours. And to hear the cover-up that happened after the UFOs shut down those nuclear, I mean, it was intense. And he was threatened with everything you can imagine. Why? And you have to ask, you have to ask, why was there a cover up instead of a extreme mm -hmm. response, which is what you should have had, right? This is a national security issue, certainly. Yeah. Why? What's actually going on here? I mean, is this just the incapability of our leaders or is it worse? And if it's worse, then I'm glad the inspector general is involved because somebody needs to go to jail for this, perhaps. I don't yeah. I don't want to promote that. But it's a, clearly a problem. I mean, this is and this is what this is the feeling I had on watching the video. I'm just expressing my emotions at this point. But I'm watching that press conference. I thought we we have a real problem on our hands and somebody needs to be paying attention to this now that was around 2015 so i i i didn't just jump into i'm going to study ufos i mean uh, that, i'm not crazy <laughs> um, for, i shouldn't use the word crazy i use that word too much i'm not stupid i'm not going to throw my career away right. <laughs> studying something that's that taboo but i did start to you know pay attention and that's what I, and I think that's what needs to happen. I, I started paying attention. I started reading up on them. I started watching interviews with people who are, who, in, you know, encountered these and things and realized, wow, this is really interesting. And why aren't more people interested? This is, and it became more and more fascinating. So I think I put together a small talk that I gave to our physics department, kind of as a, just a litmus test. <laughs> How far can I push this? <laughs> And just and just present this information to my colleagues and say, look, I learned about this stuff and I'm not sure what to make of this. And that was all pre-2017, but then around, what is it, December 16th, 2017, there's only a few dates I remember. <laughs> that's one of them. You know, that's, that's when the, the New York yes. Times article came about out about the ATIP program. You know, what's the other date I remember is, um, what is it, May 25th or 26th, 1977. That's when Star Wars came out. <laughs> <laughs> and because that had a huge effect on me as well. And in your career, I'm sure. Right. So you haven't been really in this realm for all that long. It wasn't until around March or so of 2018, a few months after the ATIP yeah. program was revealed, that I started thinking scientists need to study this and maybe, maybe I can do something. And that's what I, when I started really thinking about what I might be able to do. Yes. Well, you've quickly left your mark in the UAP community. And so we are, again, so grateful to have you here with us. Well, I, I, and I often, you know, I'm, I'm often, you know, people give me credit for this a lot and I, and, you know, I'm grateful for that. But at the same time, I feel like I kind of won by forfeit. I mean, it's, <sighs> There, there, are, there are very few scientists actually involved. I mean, there are now more than there were when I started. Certainly, yeah. But it was it was not hard to become one of the world's leading scientists doing this sort of thing when there's only like three or four people actually doing it. Yeah. Well, quickly after your initial deep dive into the world of UFOs, you wrote an article titled, Are We Alone? 
the question is worthy of serious scientific study. So tell us a little bit about that particular article and what prompted you to write it. I think that's what kind of threw me into the mix. And it was a, it was a, just a random thing that happened where the media pro, media department um, at the University of Albany had gotten a message from, oh God, where was that published? I'm forgetting <laughs> which, may, which online magazine it was. <laughs> I, I sometimes look these things up while I'm in an interview, right? Because I'm on my computer. We do this name. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'll look it up for you. There's a lot to remember and have this all on the top of your, you know, top of your cortex at, at, at the, these, these times is hard to do. Yeah. So we got, but we got a call from an editor of an online magazine that wanted us to, wanted to know if there was an astronomy expert that could write an article about, and this is what they wanted. They wanted an article about UFOs for World UFO Day. And they basically said they would like an article explaining why people are so fascinated when with UFOs when there's no scientific evidence for them. <laughs> and that's what they wanted. Whoops. And I and they and so I got an email from our media department saying, you know, you teach astronomy, so would could you write something like this? And I looked at it and I thought, no scientific evidence for these things. I said, but there's really a lot of evidence for these things to be real. So and I didn't know how I felt about it. So I thought, well, what if I wrote an article about why they ought to be studied? And so I proposed that to the the editor who quickly wrote back, said, oh, that would be even better. <laughs> and, and, and I said, well, I was concerned about the fact that you wanted me to write about something, you know, why we shouldn't take it seriously. And they said, and they wrote back, well, I just said that because I didn't think I could get a scientist to get, write a positive article on your post, so, which was interesting. So I, I tentatively agreed. I, I had about a week to write that, and I thought, I'll give it a shot, and, and I'll see if I can write something that I feel comfortable with publishing. And, um, and so I, I think I put it together in about mainly in about four days and then got... I had, of course, had my wife look it over and my, and some of my colleagues look this over. And I said, you know, be critical, be just tear it apart if you have to. I don't want to publish anything that's, that's silly. And, and, and there were a few good comments that were made. And I, and I, of course, polished it up and then published that, that article, which basically argues why, why scientists ought to be studying these things. And the copy that we read is on theconversation.com. That's what it is, the conversation. I don't know why I forgot that. The conversation.com. So for our listeners that want to go and check out that article, the conversation is the website and are we alone? The question is worthy of serious scientific study by, of course, Dr. Kevin Canoe. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and it got published and I then was mortified. I thought, oh my God. What, <laughs> what, what happened when I joined this podcast? <laughs> Hey, wait a introvert, minute. <laughs> kind of an introverted scientist, I wanted to go hide in the corner somewhere. I kind of felt the way that you feel after you're, you know, you go out late at night and you're at a party and you were way too extroverted. And the next day you just want to hide in the squirrel, right? And so I... <laughs> <laughs> I've never felt that way. I don't know. <laughs> That's how I feel. So it's, um, so I felt that way after getting that published. And I just thought, well, here comes the firestorm. I mean, I'm going to get emails from scient angry scientists and all of this and and it didn't happen which which kind of stunned me in fact the only i think i only got two or three emails and they were from creationists who were angry with me proposing that god created somebody else other than humans and so and i thought well i can deal with that i don't have any problem with these guys <laughs> but but i didn't get in fact i then started getting a few emails from actual scientists saying that that was a really nice article and you're right we should be studying these things and i, I was I, I was i was really delighted to see that and then it topped like i don't know i don't know how many views it had it had like crazy number you know eight hundred thousand views or something like that and i was at the time and i was kind of blown away by this so 
Yeah, that's exciting. That's a lot of views. Hopefully now you'll get some more. We've had a few uh, people join us live, sending some love our way. Simon, Bill, hello. We've like. got Blake Fest <laughs> saying, great show. I appreciate your devotion to the subject, and I agree with you. It warrants scientific study. We have a quick question here before we move on to the next um, the next article that you've written. Uh, am I reading this right? whoop de wowsers whoop tie wowsers Do you mean put it up? Sure says, has Professor Knuth seen the MH370 videos? I don't know what those are. So the answer is no. <laughs> we better move no. on from it because it's a hot button topic. Is it? Okay. So you've seen them, Tim? Have I seen them? I have seen them. You have okay. seen them also. <laughs> we did a show on them one night, but I think you were gone. Oh, <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Smitty was with me. Those in my browser, and I'll watch them later. Well, there there's some mystery videos, and they're purported to potentially show MH370's disappearance. Oh, but... that, and that's the Malaysian airline flight, right? Yeah. Oh. Right. They involve some orbs. Yes. And I have seen them. And a flash. Yes. 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 What did did you have any thoughts about them? Again, again, I, I'm gonna default to a boring answer. The, the, the difficulty with videos like this is that they're taken from one perspective from one camera with one instrument. In science, we don't do that. We use multiple instruments. So you, you, can't, you, can very, you can very rarely learn anything meaningful from one instrument. You know, we don't do that in our experiments. We don't, I, I wouldn't, you know, of course, I've, I've tried to learn as best, as much as I can from imagery like this, you know, from one camera, but it's really limited what you can do. I get, I get, I, for a while, I was getting letters from people and emails from people with photographs of light. Say, so I, I, there was a light in the sky. Here's a picture of the light in the sky. What, what is this? <laughs> and 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 to be honest, my response, it was, I mean, and I would, I, I of course, I'm going to be polite in my in my response because they're really seeing something that's interesting them, um, and I can't, but I can't tell anything from the image, and that's it. That's not their fault. But my the thought that runs through my head is. It's a light in the sky. That's what it is. It's not, I can't tell you what the light's connected to. I can't tell you anything about the light. It's a light in the sky. That's all, that is all I can tell you from a picture of a light in the sky. And that's just a fact. I mean, that's just how it works. And this is one of the, you know, difficulties with images taken by private citizens or even by the military, you know, and, or a drone or something that usually one camera, one view, and you can, unless you already know what you're looking at and you're looking for something particular, you can't learn much from that. To be continued. Thanks. Like. Share. Follow. Comment. Subscribe. Support. What's your hot take on Travis Taylor? <laughs> <laughs> I've got an exclusive for you guys if you okay. wanted about yeah, the Alaska. We do. Okay, okay. More at BigfootUFO.com. All things unexplained. So, some of that I think, sir, will save for post session. Mm -hmm.